So uh, I will start off this meeting by welcoming everybody to another edition of SIMT DC section virtual event. Um, today is very special, but I will leave all the details to John Fulton to describe and introduce our speaker. Um, but at the very beginning, I need to do SIMT business, uh, which uh, starts with the simple statement that this event is being recorded. We always use uh, recordings to promote SIMT uh, organization. Uh, usually that ends up on a YouTube channel, uh, SIMT DC YouTube channel. Um, and if you do not want to be shown, please uh, make sure your camera is off. Uh, and uh, we will continue recording until the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, there are upcoming events, SIMT upcoming events uh, we'll have in April. Uh, presentation of the new NBC Studios uh, virtual event. This will happen on uh, April 21st uh, in the evening at 7 p.m., 7 to 8 p.m. So I will encourage you to check SIMTDC uh, um, social uh, channels for details. And I'll be sending out an email with, uh, with them uh, as the time goes on and more details are available. Um, we will also have another edition of uh, a virtual uh, town hall. We're working on this uh, and we'll spend more time working out details and sharing those with everybody. Uh, also, uh, if you are in the need of a job, uh, you have a job or you have a job you don't want and you want to assign anybody, to that job, uh, please feel free to share that information in the chat right now, or go and check out uh, our uh, job postings on SIMT.org. Uh, and uh, another way to share this information with us is to send an email um, to managers at SIMTDC.org. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, I will turn over to John Footen to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you. So everybody, welcome. Uh, I want to introduce to you Jeff Laux. Um, he is the founder and director of Deloitte's Center for Technology, Media, and Telecommunications. Uh, that's a, a part of Deloitte that does original research, so primary research and other types of research and uh, on uh, trends and other developments in technology, media, and telecommunications. Um, he's going to be talking today about trends in consumer consumption, um, some very interesting stuff that I've seen that he's done with uh, the impact of COVID on consumer behavior uh, in our industry, and also on the future of movies um, following uh, the COVID uh, impacts. The, uh, I just want to note that this is a non-technical presentation. Um, I know mo almost everybody here is an engineer of one sort or another. Um, we can certainly field technical questions, but we'd be fielding them with ourselves. <laughs> um, so Jeff is going to focus on what the trends are with consumers. Um, so hopefully uh, this will be a, a refreshing uh, difference for this group and that we'll all learn a lot uh, from him. So Jeff, over to you. Thanks very much. I appreciate the invitation, and um, I'm going to jump into the presentation. One, um, one quick, uh, you know. one, yeah, I'll let you know if it comes up. But one quick, uh, okay. point. if you have questions, um, probably easiest if you just throw it in the chat. I will monitor the chat um, for any questions at all, and I'll interrupt Jeff as appropriate and uh, get him those questions to answer. So you can send them into the chat at any point that you wish. Mom, mom. Her diaper, her diaper. Okay, I got that. No problem, that's fixed. All right, Jeff. Terrific, can you see the screen? We can, thank you. Awesome, so what I'm gonna be uh, sharing today are um, results from three different surveys that we do in Deloitte um, called Digital Media Trends. And you know, we've been doing digital media trends or uh, different varieties of this for uh, I think 15 years now upcoming. Uh, and this is a survey and a set of surveys that 
um, the Deloitte Center for Technology, Media, and Telecommunication does um, in collaboration with our uh, um, media and entertainment practice. And so we're going to be sharing data from three different surveys. One of them was before COVID began uh, in January of 2020. And then we did two other ones in, you know, one in May uh, in the immediate aftermath of, of COVID, and then one in October of 2020 to see how these um, initial changes that happened right after COVID started uh, have continued. And just as a plug, we're going to be releasing the 15th version of Digital Media Trends next month. So we're going to have fresh data on a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you today. Um, but one, one thing to understand is that a lot of the work that we do in our surveys, we break down uh, by generation so that we can see uh, how consumers are different if they're younger, uh, middle-aged like myself, or older. And as we see, some trends really do uh, really are affected by age and others aren't. So with COVID, what we saw immediately uh, after COVID started is that there was a lot of um, loss of income in households. Uh, in May 2020, about 39% said that their household income had decreased either somewhat or significantly. Uh, in October, that was a bit lower at 29%. Uh, and, you know, uh, certain things changed. People uh, got their jobs back and so forth. There were stimulus checks and so forth. But we, ha we did see in both of these surveys um, a bit of loss of income, and that, uh, we think, had an effect on some of the trends. The first trend, the big trend that I'm going to be focusing on is streaming video services, uh, subscriber-based services, um, have been popular ever since Netflix started. Uh, and what we're seeing is that uh, there are more and more services out there competing for attention, some of which are ad-based. Um, and we're gonna talk about uh, what we're finding with subscriptions, uh, how subscriber behavior has changed and what role uh, ads and ad-supported services have played in this dynamic. Before we get into ad-supported though, there's the overall um, entertain, entertainment subscription uh, landscape. And so we're talking about a subscription video, gaming, audio, uh, and news and other entertainment subscriptions. And this has been high for an awfully long time. We found in January of 2020, consumers had an average of 12 subscriptions, um, and it dropped a little bit to 11. Uh, but what we've been seeing uh, consistently is that people feel a bit overwhelmed by all the subscriptions they have to manage uh, and that uh, feeling of, of uh, confusion around what they have, what they're paying for, and also what they value. So we're seeing some pressure on the number of subscriptions that people have and some frustration in that. Hey, Jeff, a quick question Ooh. on that. Um, sure. Do you... Uh, have you seen a change in the amount of money that people pay for their total subscriptions over time? And how does that compare? Because I think this surveying goes back before digital video, right? It goes back to cable and whatnot. So how has the amount of money people are willing to pay for entertainment changed over time? We haven't really tracked um, how much people are spending, uh, but what we have been tracking, especially around um, uh, subscription video is that people generally don't want to pay more for their video subscriptions than they would have for, for regular pay TV. So there's some price sensitivity there. And then when we ask about, you know, reasons why people uh, are considering um, uh, changing their subscriptions or canceling them, cost plays a really big role. So, you know, cost is an important uh, element to all this. Um, and we're going to see that even more in the next survey that's released. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What we did end up seeing in uh, digital media trends is that the number of, of paid video subscriptions uh, went up due to COVID. So we had seen in January 2020, um, if they had a subscription, people had an average of about three of them. And uh, you know, we've seen the penetration rate go up and down a little bit, 
Uh, before COVID, it was around 73% of consumers who had at least one streaming video subscription. And again, we're talking things like, you know, Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, and so forth. Uh, that spiked up to around 80% and then down. Uh, we're seeing that go back up again. But generally, the trend is we're seeing more and more penetration of streaming video subscriptions. And if you have one, you have more of them than you used to in the past. So it's becoming a more popular form of entertainment. And a couple of things that happened since COVID is that we saw, uh, you know, boomers and others uh, start to um, experiment more with these streaming video services. Does a, does so a paid service, do does a paid service Sorry, include uh, those that are included in packages like in telecom packages or whatever? That's a great question. So, you know, yes, that yes, those do count. Um, and in fact, one of the things that we're seeing that's um, boosting penetration rates are um, bundles as well as, um, you know, free and um, other limited time offers. So these are getting people into streaming video. What we're talking about with a paid service is, you know, does it cost money? Uh, you, you know, either now or eventually for you to, to ha have access to a service. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to why people select a specific streaming service, and this is perfectly on point, uh, content is the main thing. They want to either watch a broad range of shows and movies, um, or they want to have um, access to new and original content that's not available anywhere else. So exclusive content. Um, and then sometimes that's previously released content. So may, it might be a show like Friends or Seinfeld that only one service has. But increasingly, we're seeing that having um, a free trial or a bundle is a really important thing in terms of getting people involved. And that spiked a little bit, um, you know, free trial or discounted rate, uh, especially around COVID. One thing we also saw is um, churn. So a lot of people are signing up for services, but they may not have a service for a very long time. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're going to uh, have it permanently. And so what we saw in May 2020 is that a lot of people were adding services as they had more time to, to spend uh, and they were looking for entertainment options. So, you know, we had a lot of people adding not very many people um, uh, kind of churning through adding or canceling um, and not too many people just canceling altogether. Um, fast forward to October, 2020, and we're seeing 34% saying that they're both adding and canceling services. And what we're seeing there is that people are trying a service and sometimes they're doing it just to watch a specific uh, show or movie and then they're moving on. Um, so just because you have a service may not mean that you have it forever. And this is of uh, real concern to the companies that are releasing these services because they're spending a lot of money uh, to create new content and license it, and they want people to stick around. Do you have any and other saw, questions? Sorry, we have a question. Ahead, sorry, yeah, we have a question in the chat. When will the industry hit critical mass with consumer frustration with the sheer number of offerings. Are there any signs of serious backlash on newer service entrants like slower subscription uptake, et cetera? That's an excellent question. So um, part of what, what we need to understand about this landscape is that there are around 300 um, streaming, paid streaming video services out there. So there's only so many of those that are going to be able to succeed in the long run. And, you know, some of those new entrants have done really well. Others haven't. And, and much of that has had to do with, uh, with two different things. One is the catalog of content. You know, do they have those, uh, that, that back library? Do they have the original content that's going to attract people? Um, and then the rest of it has to do with the business model. Uh, as, as we're going to see, some of the ad-supported services or, uh, you know, services like uh, Hulu that have got uh, different tiers uh, are doing quite well. So the, the main takeaway is that not all these services are going to, are going to stick around. And you can see with the, you know, the big change in churn here between uh, before and after COVID, 
Um, people are, you know, there are more people who are signing up for services, they're signing up for more of them, but they're not keeping them necessarily. You and know, so why do you, you consider, you're, sorry, you're, go ahead. Do we think we are seeing any M&A activity around digital services or anticipating any? We are seeing some of that, absolutely, um, with, uh, with mergers of, uh, you know, let's say, you know, CBS Viacom as an example. Uh, and there's going to be much more, I think, um, consolidation of content, whether that's uh, through M&A activity or through, or through buying or kind of repatriating licensed content. But yeah, I think it's going to, I think it's going to continue. These are great questions. Keep them coming. So when we, when we ask consumers why they cancel a service, um, there were a couple things that came up. One of them was cost. And you were asking about that earlier. So the service being too expensive is one thing. Um, and as a corollary to that, you know, the free trial or discount ending. So maybe they signed up for a service, but they're not comfortable paying full price. So they don't think it, it delivers enough value. Um, and then there were a couple of things that we saw around COVID, you know, certainly the lack of new content that they're interested in watching. You know, many uh, shows and movies were, were postponed. Um, and then another one here is access to content that they like through ad supported streaming video services. So, you know, uh, you know, that, that definitely increased from May to October as more of these services came online. Hey, Jeff, uh, got a question in the chat. Um, is it possible that we see ourselves going back to the pre-streaming landscape with only a relatively few ultra large providers charging high fees for, you know, for consolidating content? Great question. Um, you know, certainly content consolidation is something we've been talking about uh, in digital media trends for, for a while. Uh, and we're starting to see consolidation of, uh, of subscriptions. Uh, but one thing that's happening is that content is fragmenting a fair bit. So, um, you know, a couple of years ago, you'd be able to find uh, much of what you want on two or three different services. Now, with so many different services launching or studios launching their own streaming, uh, that you know you, you've got to have more and more services in order to get the content that you like. So we're seeing some of that content fragment, um, but you know, will there be more consolidation? Uh, it's certainly possible. Um, and then we might also see you know two or three services that are those must-haves, and others uh, are just you know. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes services. And that's what we see here. We ended up asking a question around, you know, what are your top three services? And then we said, okay, among your top three services, uh, which ones could, you know, can you just not live without? And there's a real difference between a like to have service and a must have. And we see here that, you know, the favorite service um, that people have, you know, or, or, you know, only around, you know, 30 some percent said that it was, something that they couldn't live without. Uh, and then that drops off pretty precipitously. So just because people have a service and they like the content doesn't mean that they couldn't live without it and they're gonna keep it forever. So Jeff, one of the th uh, questions in the chat has to do with the generational differences. And I notice in my own household that the reason we have some of the numbers of services we have is because I'm not the only one making the decisions about the services that we have. And my kids and my wife don't necessarily have all the same uh, uh, interests that I do. Uh, the question in the chat is, does the type of content, long form versus short form, make any difference in whether people continue with the service or does this differ from uh, generation groups? Excellent question. I don't know that that kind of long form versus short form matters as much. And, you know, in terms of really short form, we saw, you know, one service that launched um, you know, with, with uh, you know, uh, quick bites, if you will, uh, not succeed. But I think what you're talking about in terms of the fragmentation of content uh, matters a lot, right? So, you know, one of my, my kids loves uh, Japanese animation. And so we've got a uh, crunchy role for him. Another one likes, uh, you know, sci-fi. So we've got a service for him. 
Um, and then we've got the two or three other services. So, you know, having more people in the household um, uh, during COVID certainly increased the number of services. Uh, but then, you know, the number of services that you have um, depends on the, the different content that people like and how, lo how long they want to keep that. So, you know, they may want to stick, stick with a service for a long time because they like the, the deep library. Or they may just want to drop in on something because they, there's a show they want to see and then they leave. One question uh, that I have, Jeff, um, and I don't know if you're going to cover this elsewhere. So if you are, please feel free to skip me for now. But um, did you do any research on um, binging versus slower release? Because I notice more and more content is going back to the traditional once a week release model um, to hold on to people so that they're not the turn, I, I presume, to reduce churn? Well, we, we have done some research on binge watching and how much people watch at a time. Uh, we haven't specifically covered um, a series, but what we, we do have data that I'm going to be covering in a second about, you know, what we call a uh, hit and run. You watch the hits that you want and then, and then you, then you leave the service. So, you know, the longer services can keep people uh, around to watch that content. I think the, uh, the better off they may be in terms of, of the the duration. Okay. In fact, here we go. Um, we ended up asking a couple questions around, you know, you know, asking specifically, have you ever signed up to watch a specific show and then canceled when it was done, which we call hit and run? 62% said that they've done that. So, you know, people coming in to watch a specific show or movie and then leaving is a real phenomenon. And when you're seeing some of the costs of these series go up to, you know, $10 million, $15 million per episode, that's a really bad outcome for those streaming services. But then we also want to know, how long does it take people to cancel a service? You know, someone like me, I might have a mind to do it, and then I'll get around to it in a couple of months. We found that 43% say that they cancel a streaming service the same day they decide they don't want it anymore. So they make a decision and they split. Um, and around 70% said that they do it within a week. So what this means for streaming services is that there's not a lot of um, warning, if you will. People say, well, I'm not really engaging in the content. Um, th there may not be a lot of time to, um, to make special offers uh, for people who are, um, who are, are um, starting to run out of content, right? And that makes things like content discovery, um, highlighting the value that people have, you know, could get from the deeper catalog, really important. So we ended up asking people, what would keep you uh, on a service uh, if, you, if you wanted to leave? What, you know, what would, what would keep you basically? And the number one thing was very interesting, uh, getting back to cost. And that's being able to switch to a reduced cost ad supported version of a service. And as we're going to see, ad supported is getting really popular as an option. And then the other here is the release of uh, an exclusive new movie. So, you know, cost and content. These are things that we're seeing coming up over and over again. But there's another one here that we're going to cover later. And, you know, that's the ability to, you know, buy a new movie release at the same time that it's released in theaters. Um, so there are, there are things like this and um, what we might call VIP treatment, like the ability to download and watch content or getting discounts on related merchandise that are really important. So as important as content and cost are, some of these extras that can make a subscriber feel more like a, a member or a VIP, we think are going to be really important. Uh, do you do you have any thoughts? Uh, another question in the chat is: Do you have any thoughts on whether the ease of dropping out from the services is getting the services revenue that they might not otherwise have gotten? In other words, they the people are joining because they know they can leave if they don't like it. We don't study that specifically, but I think the the ease of the ease of joining is definitely part of what uh, these streaming services have wanted. Right? Um, they've wanted to go. Um, you know, from however many subscribers to a critical mass, uh, either for their investors or for their business model. So they want to um, 
get as many subscribers as possible and make it easy. And I think part of that is, you know, you know, no commitment, no contract. On the back end, it, it also makes it easier for people to leave. And so I think that's, that's something services are going to have to consider and balance. We have another question. Um, Netflix recently announced plans to license some select original content to NBCU and Viacom as non-premium. Do you think that other SVODs will seek to do this as an incremental revenue stream and to drive audience growth, referring the subscription traffic back into the SVOD? That's a good question. Um, again, not something that we that we studied specifically, but um, I think it speaks to the variety of different um, strategies that companies are going to um, be considering in order to, to make their uh, not only their services, but their content uh, as profitable as possible. I got another question. They're flowing in, Jeff. Sounds good. Uh, you've got a lot of interest. Uh, do you see? Good. Uh, do you see the entry of the Discovery Plus services having an impact on the cord cutter dynamic industry wide? Prior to the launch, most of that content, Discovery Scripts A and E, was only available as authenticated through an MPVD. Um, I don't have a, a specific. Um, uh, sense of that of that of that service, and we try not to also talk too much about one service versus another. Uh, but I, I'm going to have to. Um, uh, I, I haven't I haven't thought that one through, so I don't want to provide a, an opinion. I understand. Do you do you have um, do you still track data on cord cutting? Yes, we do. Um, so so cord cutting has has um, has continued, and. Um, you know, we've we've found um, the cable TV um, from the. I, I think we're still in the in the the sixty percent who say that they've got it, but it is it is continuing to um, um, to wind down. And certainly, one of the things that that um, all of these uh, you know networks are grappling with is how are we going to find our audience when fewer people are are, are buying a cable package. So. Um, you know, especially the services that, that aren't big or the, or the networks that aren't that big and that are heavily reliant on pay TV, they are looking for strategies for how they're going to find those, those viewers. Um, and I think you're starting to see some of this in, uh, you know, in the sports leagues as well, where they're trying to figure out with their new content deals, you know, what portion of that's going to be streaming, what portion of that's going to be uh, regular PTV, and, and I think that speaks to all kinds of content. Got a couple more questions for you, Jeff, if you don't mind. Sure, um, not at all. All right, next question. Does using a service imply that they are the subscribers themselves or possibly that they're piggybacking off of other family members, like a college kid or whatever? Right. Um, a couple of years ago, we, you know, we um, tracked who uh, was um, – you know, the subscriber and who was, was basically, you know, using a login from others, you know, it is a fairly wide, widespread practice. I think it's one that, that um, the services are able to understand, you know, whether someone's a legitimate subscriber or not. Uh, and, I, and, and I think there are two pieces here. One of them is, um, you know, are, are you piggybacking in a way that, uh, that is, you know, not okay, if you will, where, uh, where it's not a, a family or a subscription or there aren't a lot of logins versus kind of an illegitimate use of a login. Um, you know, with services like the, the, the music streaming services, um, there are uh, subscriptions for a specific number of members and family subscriptions. So that's pretty widespread. Um, but services do know if, um, if a login isn't legitimate. And I think for a while they've been okay with that because they wanted more subscribers. I think you're going to see more services uh, cracking down on that as they're looking to, uh, to get more profits. Yeah, literally last night, one of the services, I won't name which one, asked me for my address, which I guess they didn't know uh, because uh, they didn't pay attention to the credit card info, I guess. But anyway, <laughs> they asked me for my address to start verifying who's in the household. Um, so that's interesting. Another question for you. 
It would seem like the free or discounted first months of service deals being used to create demand would have a 30 to 90 day drop rate increase. Is that what you're seeing? In other words, I think if Dave, Dave Van Hoy, if I can try to paraphrase, paraphrase what you're saying, because they are giving free um, time in advance, are people dropping at the end of the free period on a regular basis? Well, we, we are seeing a lot of a lot of churn because the, the the free service expired. So, you know, if we move back, if we look back a couple here, uh, where are we? The free trial or discount ended uh, is a big reason for for people canceling, and you know, especially um, uh, it, it was especially true in May when people were doing more experimentation. But I think this is something that we're going to see more of. Um, you know. And, and the ways that people can access the service are changing too. For a while, you could get a, a free a free streaming service for a month by ordering a pizza, right? So they're trying to find almost any way to get people in, so that you'll uh, you know get in there and find and find the content valuable. But if you don't find it valuable enough to pay to pay full price, uh, then you're going to leave. And we do see a lot of that. Yeah, Jeff. I, I mean, as a follower of these trend surveys for some years now. Um... One thing I think is interesting is because you followed them over time, the changes are really notable. They weren't, they weren't, you know, from January to May to October. Normally, you only check in once a year, right? Um, so that's right. So from year to year, it looked similar-ish. I mean, there were changes, obviously, but the real dramatic changes uh, from January to May to October um, as the COVID um, crisis continued. And I think it's extremely notable. And of course, you're seeing it in the data here. Absolutely. And I think it's it, it's from two different things. One of them, obviously, is COVID. Uh, people had more time uh, to spend, uh, fewer entertainment options out of the household. And for many people, they had more people in the household than they normally would. But you're also seeing more services launching, including, as we're seeing on this slide, more ad-supported services. Um, the, the dominant model had been one where, you know, in the U.S. anyway, um, a it was a, sub a paid subscription uh, with no ads, right? Uh, that's the, the model that uh, Netflix has pioneered and many people follow that. Now, what you see in countries like China and India and others is there are m multiple tiers with a free ad supported being, being a big part of that. It's only recently that in the U.S., there have been these different tiers. Um, you know, Hulu notably has got um, you know a a paid you know a, a paid subscription fee where um, you can avoid ads. Uh, another one where you pay less to have ads. We'll talk about that in a second. But then now there are these free ad supported services as well, and we saw a big jump in the consumers who are using these services. Um, it's leveled off a little bit in our latest survey, but it went from you know. In January, 40% saying that they used one, then 47%, then 60%. And where you can see a lot of change here is in, you know, the boomers and even the matures and, and Gen X. Um, so ad supported is becoming a big part of the landscape. Uh, there's high quality content and you don't have to pay. And this is exactly what we see when we ask people why they use these services. Uh, the, the top one is it doesn't cost anything. But a second one here I think is really important, and that's the ease of access. It's easy to use a paid, uh, uh, I'm sorry, an ad supported uh, service through, you know, a Fire Stick, a Roku TV, um, any sort of smart TV is just getting, it's just getting much easier. And then once people start to watch it, they realize that they like the broad range of shows and movies. So there's a lot to like, and I think what people are doing is they're, you know, ad supported isn't necessarily going to, to replace um, paid streaming, but it's going to augment it so that people have got more options to kind of stack services or create their own bundles. And we ended up asking a hypothetical question um, of, of our uh, respondents. We said, you know, imagine that you we're going to sign up for a service that you knew you wanted. So you, you know you like the content. You know, 
And then we gave them three options. One is uh, no monthly subscription fee at all, but 12 minutes of ads per hour. Um, the second one was some ads, uh, $6 a month subscription fee and about six minutes of ads per hour. And then the final one was, you know, you pay a $12 a month subscription fee with no ads. And what we found is that more people prefer the ad only option. Uh, and that's one that, again, hasn't been um, explored by, by that many uh, services until recently. About 22% say they'd like some ads, so they, they like a blend. And then there is a group, and we find that the, it's a pretty stable group between 35 and 40% to say, you know what, I'll pay to have no ads because I prefer the ad-free experience. But more people would prefer at least some ads uh, to that um, ad-free experience. So it shows, uh, I think, how much um, uh, of a you know, high ceiling that these ad-supported services have. And especially among consumers who didn't have a streaming video service. So we said, you know, for, for, you know we cut this by consumers who don't have a streaming video service. And for those folks, um, an ad only option is, you know, over, is the overwhelming choice. And finally, when we take a look at this by generations, we see that, you know, the ad only option is something that boomers and matures really favor. Uh, and part of the reason is because, you know, we think uh, it's the lack of cost, but also the, um, the TV experience ends up being uh, sometimes a lot like linear TV. So if you go to Pluto TV, for example, or, and, and others, uh, you'll see that there are channels. And so you can select or, you know, you can kind of select a channel and you've got your options there in front of you instead of kind of being faced with a, a blank screen or a choice. What am I going to watch? Um, it's very much like linear TV. And then, of course, there's the cost element. Whereas Gen Z and millennials who grew up with um, subscription-based TV as an option uh, are more likely to pick that one. Now, just because people like uh, ad support, ad-supported um, streaming doesn't mean that they love ads necessarily. We asked a question saying, you know, how many of ads per hour, uh, how many minutes of ads per hour would you say is just about right? And then how many minutes of ads are too much where you, know, you, would, you would quit watching? What we found is that um, consumers say seven minutes of ads per hour is about right, but they stop watching when it gets to more than 14 minutes of ads. Uh, we've done this for a couple of, of years. It's pretty, pretty steady here. Um, but when you think about the experience that you have with, uh, with pay TV, it's often going to be 16 minutes, even sometimes 20 minutes of ads per hour. And that's where many consumers say it's too much uh, and they want to opt out. So I think part of the um, popularity of ad supported streaming is that um, services are, are hitting that, you know, five minutes, seven minutes of ads per hour. Um, whereas I think some of the, declining popularity of pay TV has to do with the fact that there, um, there are just too many ads for consumers. Yeah, Jeff, we're seeing uh, experimentation in the traditional linear market over ad load and, you know, the value of inventory um, in that ad load. Um, I got another question for you. Is there any sure. backlash regarding services which were originally ad free, Amazon Prime, for example, which now runs, which will now run promotional ads prior to running the program that was selected. So the, the promos and the things that are now starting to show up before you can get to your program. Um, and then actually, I'll throw in another thing that's not in the question sure. so that, but then also they've been putting in skips to skip over parts of the content that are repetitive in, in things. Have you studied any of that? We haven't studied that, but those are both really interesting areas to study. Um, what I would say around the, um, uh, the, the ad supported content versus, you know, kind of no, no longer ad supported. I think we're starting to see experimentation, you know, uh, you know, how are we going to move, move content that was ad free number one. And then number two is being able to experiment of, you know, what are people going to be willing, uh, willing to watch? Um, ad supported versus ad free. So I think we're just uh, services are trying to feel out um, 
you know, what they can move uh, to add supported. Um, can they end up introducing more content uh, that they wouldn't necessarily have under the subscription based model alone. Um, but I think, again, uh, these services are just trying to feel, feel this out around ads because it's not, it wasn't part of their original model. So here are a, a few questions that streaming video um, providers could, um, can ask themselves. You know, I think part of it is understanding their existing subscribers and what, uh, what will keep those subscribers around. What is it that they value about your service? Um, and what could you uh, highlight that they, that they don't uh, value as much as per, perhaps they could? Uh, and, and keeping them on your service is much better than paying to reacquire them after they churn, absolutely. Um, some of it has to do with um, understanding um, why they're leaving, what you could do to keep them. And then uh, as we described in our, one of our churn papers, that, that kind of talked about that specifically, um, you know, could membership have its privileges? Could you end up moving from a, you know, subscriber model to one where if, if, you are, if you're a subscriber, you, you get the VIP treatment? Um, and then I think finally here, um, it's the path to profitability. Um, pay TV was one of the most profitable business models there was, right? And, um, Streaming services aren't necessarily as popular uh, as profitable and some, you know, haven't reached profitability yet. So what are some of the paths to profitability uh, around, you know, leveraging data, personalization uh, and potentially ads. So I'll pause there for any any questions before I move on to um, Movies. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's move. Oh, sorry, we did. We did. We did actually get a question. In. Sorry. Um, sorry, John. Uh, do you, how do you foresee these streaming platforms becoming full replacements for cable and satellite? Amazon Prime has linear channels now. Netflix is experimenting with linear channels. HBO Max doesn't have CNN on it or sports yet. Do we see these services having news and sports? I think another way I would put that question, which I've thought about myself, is: Are we just heading back to the past over time, just in a different environment, you know, different technical environment? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it has to do with um, some of it has to do with pay TV and how pay TV, um, you know, reacts and and what the the um, penetration remains over time. But certainly, if you've got you know, 40%, 50% of consumers just not, uh, not using pay TV services, um, all these, you know, studios and sports leagues and so forth are going to have to adapt. They're going to have to find a way to, um, to get in front of those, con those consumers, uh, whether it's a, you know, paid streaming subscription, whether it's ad supported, whether it's aggregation, but you can't just ignore that, that big and growing chunk of the market. Uh, that is opting out of TV. Um, what exactly that looks like, I think, is a, is a really fascinating question. Um, but what we are seeing now, I think, is consumers honestly opting for what they've what they asked for from pay TV providers for a while, which is, can I have more flexibility in what I pay? Can I have more flexibility in the content that I get instead of buying a service with you know lots of channels at a fixed cost? So. I think this is a, a bit of a market reaction to consumers wanting more control and more flexibility. Um, again, as these services fragment, as content fragments, as you need more and more of those services to watch what you want, um, will people find it as valuable? I think it's uh, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I does think that answer kind of what was what you wanted to know? I think it does. I'm just looking at the question. Obviously, the, the questioner can speak up. But um, the uh, uh, one thing I think you said was very interesting is that what these streaming services are doing, because it's just a different technical means of getting the video content to them. But what these streaming services are doing is giving them the business model they, they were demanding for decades from the regular MPVDs, you know, the, the short subscription times, the 
flexibility in the exact content types and things like that. So it's a very interesting point. Um, another question, any insight regarding ad supported services that use natural breaks in the program versus those that drop ads in on absolute time sequence? So some of them are actually understanding when the break should occur versus others that are not. Have you done any studying on that? And the no, I haven't. Um, but but I do I do think it's I do think it's an interesting question. Um, you know, how are you going to be able to intersperse ads and make them feel uh, kind of make them feel natural? Um, I'll have to plead ignorance there, though. Um, I do want to return to the point of of KTV uh, and just say this. I think what we end up seeing with digital disruption of all kinds is that when the market is signaling over and over again that, that it, it would like something different um, and providers don't adjust to that and don't adapt to that, that I think is, it opens the door for, for digital disruptors who are gonna find another technical means, another business model to give people what they want. And I think that's true of nearly every industry and that's really the secret to why some of these industries have been disrupted to the extent that they have. That's a great point uh, of seeing it in healthcare now, for example, uh, and, and in many other industries. Uh, we got a comment and a question. Relative to streaming services as a viewer, the negative impact of number of minutes per hour is positively impacted by knowing the ad break is mostly a single ad and that back to the show. Even if the ad is longer, I know that when it concludes, the show is back. It is not a mystery how many more ads are coming before the show returns, have you measured this metric? I believe that that on some of the services, they will let you know how much, how long the break is that you're in and when it's going to be over. The only thing that we've measured is really that time, that that time duration. That and and that's really the trade-off that you know, uh, you know, time and attention for for entertainment value. Um, but I do think. Um, you know, you, you raise an interesting point, you know, knowing how long you've got, you've got to wait, um, you know, and knowing that it's not too long, I think can, um, can keep people wanting to use um, ad supported services. But again, I think there's just a lot of experimentation, figuring out how to, um, how to make this work uh, with services, understanding that people may not love ads, um, you know, people want ads that are, uh, we, we do know uh, from uh, other questions in digital media trends that people value ads of shorter duration. They value ads where um, it's something that they uh, would like to buy. You know, I, one of the things that I, I say over and over again um, is, you know, I personally like small hatchbacks. I've got a, a, a VW Golf. Um, I'll never buy a pickup truck, even though a lot of people think they're great. But if I watch um, a football program, I'm, I'm constantly being shown pickup trucks that I'm never going to buy. Not great for the pickup truck manufacturers, not great for me. So, you know, can we find ways that people can get the ads they're going to find valuable, both in terms of duration and in terms of, uh, uh, of the content? You know, the most successful services, I think, are going to figure that out. Great. I think we should probably get into the movies given the time remaining. Okay. Um, how much, how much time do we have? Well, um, these meetings have typically been able to run long. Um, so basically I think, and, uh, Mache, I don't know if you agree, but just take the time that you need to take. Um, we might see people drop off at the top of the hour for all, you know, they might, or they might not, but, um, okay. Well, I, I think I can, you know, first of all, keep the questions coming. I think they're great, but I'll, yep. I'll, I'll go through and then whenever, whenever you call time is great. And uh, hopefully we can uh, all meet again. But certainly when we think about movies and the future of movies, um, it's no mystery that COVID-19 put movies on hold and put theaters in jeopardy very suddenly, right? And these are some of the headlines that we saw at the time. You know, there were movie delays, uh, especially for big blockbusters. Uh, movie chains were, were in economic distress. Um, and the question was, you know, what does, this, uh, what does this mean for the future of movies? Well, in the questions that we asked in digital media trends uh, in our survey, um, we found that, um, this is the October survey, a lot of people, you know, you know, still weren't really ready to go back to the movies. 
um, and they didn't know when that would be. Now, certainly um, vaccines and so forth are going to help with that, but you know, there's still a lot, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty about when people might feel comfortable going back to the theater. But people still wanted to watch movies. And so what we found is that more were um, paying to stream a newly released movie at home. Um, in May 2020, when there are only a few options, we had, I think, a pretty significant number, 22% saying that they had paid to watch, uh, you know, a, a first run newly released movie at home. Fast forward to October 2020, 35% said they had done that. And, you know, in both of these surveys, both the May and the October one, 90, over 90% say that they, they enjoyed it and that they would do it again. And when we had entered asking a hypothetical question in October, you know, where would you prefer to watch a newly released movie? What we found is that more people said that they would probably watch it um, you know, either definitely or probably watch it at home than at a theater. It was about 23% saying that they, you know, are likely either way. And so, you know, moving forward after COVID, you know, we think that a lot of people are going to want to watch movies on their couch rather than in the theater. Now, is that going to be all movies? You know, our data says no, but certainly there's a lot of demand again to watch first run movies at home. And when there's market demand, uh, there's going to be uh, people willing to satisfy that. And in fact, that has really big, uh, a really big impact on the theatrical window, uh, which we'll talk about in more detail in a second. But these are all headlines pulled from just this last month. You know, film distribution executives are saying, look, the old windowing um, system wasn't working as well as it could. Um, you know, there's experimentation around, um, you know, theatrical windows. How long is something going to be in a theater? Uh, when's it going to go to streaming? Um, and there's, I think, a really big challenge that companies have around um, not just their movies, but also how their movies are going to um, interact with their streaming services. Uh, and some say that the pandemic's permanently changed things. So the traditional um, Hollywood windowing system, which I'm sure you all know well, you know, there's a the theatrical release in movie theaters, you know, up to about three months. And then you ended up having these different uh, and, you know, usually exclusive platforms, right? It would go to home video, then a premium TV network, and then, you know, basic um, or free TV, right? Um, and so originally something would be in the theater for three months, even longer. And then you'd have these different windows uh, where you'd, uh, you know, where they'd make money. What we found is that the uh, amount of money that studios would make from, you know, uh, TV, video, and D DVD, um, it changed, right? So in, in 2000, you made a lot more money from TV and video and DVD than you did from the box office. Now, when you move, so when you fast forward to um, 2020, that's 46% um, it, from the box office. And so while there's tension around the traditional windowing, um, there's also um, some concern that this is how movies are making a lot of their money. So, you know, what is going to happen with windowing uh, and theatrical releases? How much time is going to be spent in the theaters versus others? And if it changes, what happens to the profitability? Thankfully, I think for, for movie companies uh, and studios, um, they, can, they can kind of pursue a strategy where some of these movies that do really well in the theaters in the box office um, can go into the box office and have a, a, maybe a longer run versus genres that don't. And so you can see here, you know, action, animated, um, you know, sci-fi, uh, they, they do better in the theaters than comedies and dramas and so forth. So one of the strategies is, you know, considering whether movies need to be released in the theater. Uh, and if they are released, do they need to, do they all need to have the same window? And, you know, this is a quote from a um, domestic distribution president you know, recently saying, you know, over the past five years, uh, these uh, wide release um, films made most of their money 
in the first 45 days. So, you know, maybe uh, there's an opportunity to uh, have windowing for some of these uh, some of these movies and have that window shorter. And certainly we've seen some agreements um, uh, with windowing as short as 17 days in the theater and then moving on. And again, you know, remembering churn, you know, first run movies can help streaming services retain subscribers. And I think for all of these studios that have got a streaming service, thinking about how, how they're making money, you know, first run, um, streaming, you know, retaining their streaming subscribers, this is all just getting a little bit more complicated than it was um, because they need to make sure that they're releasing movies to provide that original content, to provide that VIP treatment to both attract and retain um, their, their uh, streaming subscribers. And that means that, you know, kind of measuring the box office tickets versus streaming revenues is not going to be an apples to apples comparison. It's more complicated. And I think um, studios are going to have to think about um, their portfolio of, uh, of revenue uh, sources. So box office, uh, streaming revenue, and so forth. And, you know, when we think about uh, some of the key considerations for studios, you know, what is the role of, of um, theatrical release going to be versus direct distribution? You know, how can they take a portfolio approach? Um, and then, you know, is PVOD going to be able to fully replace theatrical revenues? Or is that more nuanced approach going to be the, the way to work? Um, these are all questions that, um, that studios need to ask themselves. Uh, and I'll pause there for any questions on this uh, section. Well, anybody have any questions? You can jump off mute if you'd like. Nope, nothing uh, yet, Jeff. Terrific. Well, these are the, the main two sections I wanted to cover. So, um, you know, it, I think uh, we can hit our, our one hour um, deadline, but I do want to thank you um, uh, for your time and for your fantastic questions. Um, and if you have any, um, any other questions, please uh, contact me.